Hey there, my name is Curtis Lucas and you're watching Empire Building. Last week, Culpa Research released a scathing report on Core Scientific. And these short sellers have a dark theory about Core Scientific that they couldn't wait to share with us. I've stumbled onto a major company conspiracy, Mac. How about that for stress? What the hell are you talking about? They are claiming that Core Scientific insiders have a devious scheme to dump 282 million shares on unsuspecting investors. This company is being bled like a stuck pig, Mac, and I got a paper trail to prove it. Check this out. Take a look at this. Jesus Christ, Charlie. that right there. In this episode, we're going to dive into this short report and try to separate fact from fiction. Okay, so I decided, oh shit, buddy, I gotta dig a little deeper. Before we get started, there is one thing I would like to say, and that is we have a tendency to dismiss short sellers uh, as being evil or having their own motives uh, and only out to short and distort. Uh, they get a really bad rap. And in some cases, this is true. But I would caution against simply dismissing short sellers simply out of spite. If you're invested in this company, you should at least read and understand this report and then evaluate it for yourself. That's what we're gonna do in this video. So this is the report. Uh, we're gonna get right into this. I've already gone through this report and highlighted some key sections that I wanna bring your attention to. Uh, for starters, uh, they get into who the founders of Core Scientific are. In this case, uh, Darren Feinstein, who founded Core in 2017 and founded BlockCap, which became Core's largest customer in 2020. Feinstein now owns 41 million core shares worth $317 million. That, that's impressive. Uh, to our knowledge, they say, Feinstein has never been found guilty of a crime. We aren't here to impugn on his business ac acumen either. After all, he did help turn 58 million into over $1 billion in just seven months. However, we did notice how uncanny it is that Feinstein's business associates often show up in criminal operations. So obviously what they're going for here, their tactic is to represent uh, Mr. Feinstein uh, as not necessarily having a shady history himself, but basically uh, aligning himself with those who are. Basically saying birds of a feather flock together. Their first claim was that Feinstein owned the Viper Room, which hosted the infamous Molly's Game, illegal poker ring. This ring was then tied to a $100 million plus Russian money laundering operation, prosecuted by the Department of Justice in 2013. Uh, I haven't gone in to research this particular uh, accusation, but I will say the movie on Molly's Game is fantastic. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Go watch that video, like, right away. Uh, very, very thoroughly enjoyed it. And at least from the perspective uh, that you gain after watching that movie, uh, you might see this uh, a little differently. Having said that, it is just a movie. I haven't studied the case itself and um, what may have uh, evolved from all of that. But again, what they're suggesting here is that not that he did anything wrong. All he did is lease the room. Did he know what was going on in that room? Would he have known anything about it whatsoever? There's no proof of that. And certainly there have been no charges levied against him as a result of it. So uh, they're, it's just another one of those claims that they're getting into. And they do more and more and more of that. They basically look into every one of his partners, associates and people that he has done business with in the past that have had anything uh, criminal uh, surface in their own lives, but nothing tied directly to him. They also really have a hard time with the block cap acquisition that was uh, announced and disclosed in the uh, pre-merger documents, the SPAC documents. Basically, they say here that we believe that the five insider managed entities that came together to form block cap in December 2020 range from suspect to outright shells. For example, BEP 999 LLC was formed just three weeks earlier, held zero operating assets, had generated zero revenues, and had not ordered any Bitcoin miners. 
BlockCap issued over 7 million shares for this entity. Basically, they're suggesting that what they paid for uh, those entities amounted to $1.46 billion um, for what they say was worth only $58.5 million. Now, I'm not as up to speed with everything that goes into uh, these types of transactions, specifically these SPACs, but based off what I've been uh, able to glean from all of this is it may be possible that whatever acquisitions or companies uh, that were part of this acquisition may have been a way of rebalancing ownerships across the, the companies and all the different entities uh, to better reflect what each person's ownership of the final entity would be. Again, I'm no expert in these matters, but that's really not what I would choose to look at when trying to decide whether or not core scientific is, in good, is a good investment or not, because really that's what it boils down to. If any of these uh, look to you to be red flags, then that's a decision that you can make for yourself. But we're just getting started, so let's keep moving. A lot of this early part of the report is to do basically a summary. So they get into the further details as we keep going. So we're just going to keep moving down until we get to those. We also think that Core has widely overhyped the profitability of its self-mining business, where we estimate all-in break-even costs at $41,723 per BTC versus the company's SPAC claims of $2,700, just in power costs per BTC. As such, we see Core as effectively using public markets to throw good money after bad while insiders set themselves up to dump billions worth of stock. So we're going to look at these figures. Um, they do get into the math uh, to how they get this 41,000 number or nearly 42,000 versus the 2,700 that uh, was uh, published in the SPAC. They say here again that Core benefited from a sweetheart deal in its Dalton, Georgia operations, which account for approximately 170 to 185 megawatts of capacity. This four, basically 4.2 cents per kilowatt hour pricing cap expired at year end 2021, just in time for the SPAC closing. Based on current Dalton pricing, we think power costs should roughly double. This claim here is quite funny. And again, we're going to get back into this when they get into for, for more information further in the report. Um, but yes, there is, uh, there's some information that you have to be made aware of with regards to that claim. Core assumed a BTC network hash rate of just 106 exahash per second, which has since ballooned to 197.2 exahash per second. Um, so yes, this is true. They, when they published that uh, SPAC report, we, this was during the, the depths of the China exodus of miners where the hash rate plummeted. And uh, yeah, so it looked pretty darn good on their report. However, I mean, any of, them, any of us who are investing in uh, Bitcoin mining stocks know full well how this works. This is no secret to any of us. It's not like they were pulling the wool over our eyes. This is readily apparent to everybody and it is uh, a figure that's available anytime anyone wants to look at it. So regardless of what they chose to report on the day that that uh, report was issued, as far as I'm concerned, is irrelevant. Every single miner is subjected to the exact same condition. So moving on. Again here, they're making the claim that uh, their actual cost to mine a Bitcoin is closer to 42,000, uh, suggesting that they're barely making money at today's prices. In fact, at today's prices, they'd be losing money at, for every Bitcoin that they mine, according to uh, the Culpa research. Again, I'm going to keep repeating these things because they do show up again later on. So let's move down until they get into the actual uh, data and what they're using to back up their claims. Again, here they point out the different entities that were acquired as part of the block cap uh, acquisition. Uh, again, I can't really uh, suggest much about this. We can't make any intelligent claims um, that would suggest anything at all, other than Perhaps it was their way of rebalancing the ownership of the final entity uh, to reflect that. Uh, and you could consider that to be some kind of uh, fancy accounting shenanigans. Um, but the fact of the matter is, if you're whether you chose to invest in the SPAC uh, before its uh, debut, 
then yeah, there's different, I guess you, you might look at this a little bit differently. But today, all of that has now passed and we're looking at its post-merger um, market cap and what this company could eventually be worth. So as far as I'm concerned, whatever happened prior to that uh, merger and acquisition taking place has very little relevance as of today. So this is one item that took a lot of attention around the time that this short report was published, I believe the same day or next day at least anyways, uh, that they have a, uh, they waived the lockup period for the, sh uh, the shares. And there has been since a, a statement released by Core Scientific about this lockup or the unlocking of these shares. Uh, so we'll have a little quick look at that when we're done as well. But yeah, this basically is saying that the, they're going to be a, insiders that held these shares prior to the merger will be able to sell them uh, beginning March 10th, which is uh, two days from the time I'm recording this. So uh, I believe that'll be Thursday this week. And then, of course, the big one. Uh, we think Core's largest would-be hosting customer, Any, is a stock promotion. Obviously, on this channel, we know full well what is going on over at Any and the new miner deal, which is largely what they are um, using to claim sort of wrongdoings here, potentially, uh, that basically they're accusing Any of outright fraud, uh, but interesting enough, any is not the stock that they're shorting. It's core, which is at least an arm's length removed from whatever's going on over at any. But uh, obviously the deal that any and um, core scientific have has nothing to do with that new miner that uh, was announced that is still sort of up in the air. Um, I have no further updates in case you're wondering. Uh, there have been no more communications from New Miner. Uh, they've ignored any other attempts I've made to make contact with them. So basically, they don't want to talk. Uh, and I haven't made any further videos on it because there's nothing really more for me to say until uh, more information comes to light. But yes, um, I still remain uh, very cautious over that uh, announcement. And it still doesn't look any better to me today than it did then. But as far as this is concerned, the deal between Any and Core Scientific have nothing at all to do with New Miner. The miners that they have agreed to host from Any were uh, was a purchase that was announced from Bitmain. These miners are real. I have checked the SEC filings. It's a real order from Bitmain. This is not fake. So if nothing else, it seems pretty apparent that the uh, hosting deal that any and uh, Core Scientific have, it's real. There's no reason to believe it's not real or won't uh, actually happen unless something were to happen uh, to any itself. So if you evaluate that as a risk, then there could be a potential issue there. However, as far as I would say is if that deal was to go through, then that just either means one, they just have a whole lot more uh, capacity that they could use for their self mining operations, or they just pick up another customer. Uh, I hear uh, Mara might be looking for some space. So I don't see how this is really a problem for Core Scientific. It's basically uh, a non issue, at least in my book, anyways. So moving on, what else have they got? They got to have something better than this. Obviously, yeah, they go into a whole lot of uh, what's going on with New Miner, um, even more um, issues. So if you want to read through that, I, yeah, sure, go ahead, have a look at it. But I still don't see how any of this has anything to do with what is happening over at Core Scientific. But again, they're pointing at these things, suggesting that birds of a feather flock together. But it doesn't actually hold a whole lot of water as far as I'm concerned. They also point out that they had uh, done something similar to this in the past, uh, partnering with a brand new chip manufacturer that had this, uh, made these wild claims about this brand new Bitcoin miner from a never heard of before uh, company uh, and uh, made claims like this, which is actually very similar to the type, type of claims that are found on uh, New Miner's website, uh, where the, is they claim to have this FPGA prototype ASIC microchip, 
which is a contradiction in terms that they point out here. And they're absolutely right about that. Uh, you cannot have a minor that is both an FPGA and an ASIC. The two things are opposite. An FPGA is programmable for a wide variety for a wide array of functions, while an application specific integrated chip is programmed for a single use. The chip cannot be both. This is absolutely true. Anytime you see those types of claims, it should set off a red flag. Now, it's not clear. Again, I don't know a whole lot about this deal. We do know that it never came to, to uh, fruition. Um, but again, I'm not sure how much I care about what happened in the past because what's happening today, you know, proof is in the pudding. So we're going to get to that part very, very soon. This is where we get to the good part. Uh, my favorite part, that is. Uh, we think Core widely overstates the profitability of its self-mining operations. Core SPAC presentation touted a mining break-even of $2,700 in power costs per Bitcoin. Yet we estimate Core's true go-forward power costs are $10,845 per BTC, or four times this figure. And the company's all-in cost to mine, including miner costs and G&A, is... $41,723 per Bitcoin. They start by pointing out that they assumed a hash rate at about 106 exahash. And as we know, it's substantially higher today. Great, so is it for everybody else. So it's an even playing field as far as that's concerned. You cannot judge one miner versus another based on the network's hash rate. It doesn't play into this. But yes, it is an important factor for determining, in fact, what this company's cost to mine a Bitcoin is. So let's keep reading. Core Sweetheart Power Agreement price cap expired at the year end 2021. This is true. I looked it up. It is, in fact, expiring. Uh, they have uh, that outlined here. Uh, it was specifically, well, they had agreed to pay Dalton. It was actually not... 4.2 it was not to exceed 4.2 their actual uh payment rate was closer to 3.64 and this is where it gets interesting because they point out down here that core scientific agreed to pay dalton uh 0.0364 on a kilowatt per hour basis as modified from time to time but not to exceed 4.2 prior to December 31st, 2021. The Georgia rate survey showed Dalton Utilities held a winter 2021 rate of 9.6 per kilowatt hour. Thus, illustratively, Core's fully baked cost for its Georgia facilities at full capacity would more than double. So luckily, this does it has a hyperlink here. So when you click on this, it's going to take us to the residential uh, survey that they're speaking of where you can see that uh, for this region, the lowest rate was at uh, 8.4 cents. Uh, they're saying the average rate around seven or, or nine or so cents. But the thing you have to look at right at the top of this form is this is a residential rate survey. This has nothing to do with large scale commercial customers. What I pay for electricity in my home is not the same rate a large-scale industrial customer will pay. So it seems reasonable for me to assume that, in fact, whatever they renew that contract at will be relatively similar to what it is now. If you are a commercial customer, you are not paying these rates. You're getting a far better deal. So this, uh, this claim they make... Uh, that's based off that survey, again, seems pretty pointless as far as I'm concerned. So what I find interesting is after they went through all of that, when they actually start going in to calculate uh, what their cost to mine a Bitcoin is, they don't actually use the nine cent uh, per kilowatt hour. They assume a power cost of six cents. Uh, maybe they realize that uh, that nine cent number is uh, not very realistic. They also assume a pool fee of 2% and uh, uptime of 95%. I don't agree with these numbers. Um, I don't, they don't really give any explanation for why 95%. Uh, these, when you have a well-running mining farm, there's no reason for really any downtime unless uh, once those miners get a little bit older. But 
in the early days, I, I wouldn't be looking at a 95% runtime um, consistently. Unless, of course, you're Mara, in which case that's another thing altogether. So while I recognize that, yeah, their, uh, the original claim that their cost to mine a Bitcoin is probably not, I believe it was 2400 or 2500 I would suggest it's probably closer to $6,500, in my opinion. But certainly not the t almost $11,000 that they're claiming here. Uh, I don't think any of their math makes sense. And they're basing it off poor information. Uh, based off what they think their electricity rates are. So that's where I would put that, closer to $6,500. When it gets into their operational costs, this is one. This is a tactic used many, many times uh, for just about every analyst that I see cover these companies. They take a look at their uh, annual reports over the past year uh, or six months or whatever, and they uh, assign that a certain value and basically claim that that's going to be their operational cost on a go-forward basis, which makes absolutely no sense. These are companies that are growing very, very fast. They have to spend a lot of money to build out these facilities. They also are in the midst of uh, periods of time when they're uh, growing rapidly, so their stock-based compensation is quite high. But again, this is why I think what they were doing when they were sort of rebalancing that um, uh, the company structure uh, and awarding those uh, those uh, that no that number of shares to their uh, internal group, I believe what they were doing was basically front running uh, what they would have eventually had to do by awarding those uh, that stock based compensation. My guess is that we won't see that the same level of stock-based compensation that we've seen in other uh, public companies because they've already done it. But all the same, again, uh, these operational expenses that we've seen over the past year or two uh, do not reflect what their ongoing expenses are going to be once these facilities are up and running. But again, these things can be relatively hard to account for, so I can understand that. But this is why I don't take uh, what they, how they evaluate this. They basically say, well, for starters, that the miners themselves, they start by suggesting that the miner acquisitions, that each miner, they would have paid about $6,000 because on the uh, secondary market, these miners are going at between ten dollars and $15,000 which can be true. I think that's actually come down as of late. Um, so they assume it's at $6,000. But again, they just pull this number out of nowhere. Um, I choose to have a look and see what other miners are actually paying. And if we compare that to Riot and Mara, uh, we've seen that back in uh, December of 2020, Riot was purchasing those same miners for an average cost of 2200 Sorry, two thousand four hundred and twenty-eight dollars. Uh, so way less than six thousand dollars. And uh, Riot bought those same miners uh, at thirty-two ninety-seven. So by the time the these figures were coming out, by the time these miners were being purchased, um, that would have been at least around that time. So again, even if you estimate um, something even more than that. I would put it closer to $3,500 per miner, uh, placing it above both Riot and Mara. But $6,000 is just way too high as far as I'm concerned. When you're making the scale of the purchases that Core Scientific has, they've been growing even faster than Riot and Mara. So it stands to reason they were getting as good, if not better deals than them. The other thing is they base their costs on a useful life of two and a half years. Give me a break. These things will last closer to five years. Um, but for the sake of argument, I'm going to say four. But definitely these will last longer than that. So whether or not they'll still be profitable to use after that amount of time remains to be seen. It depends on what the price of Bitcoin is. But today, people are still using S9s to mine with. So that should tell you something. They're more than four years old at this point. So when you do that math, instead of getting a BTC break-even cost on the miners of $15,000, uh, it's actually $5,500. And again, down here with a uh, claim that Core spent uh, $16,847 uh, 
dollars in operating expenses for each BTC mined. Um, so they look at the uh, 2020 year cost and then also for the nine months ending in Q3 2021. And they basically work it out to the same figure. But again, they're evaluating that based on a time with rapid growth. It is not reasonable, in my opinion, to be using that figure uh, for fo forecasting four to five years out. It just doesn't make any sense. I'll acknowledge that evaluating these things can be difficult, but if you were to do that to any of the other miners, you'd have the exact same or worse result in some cases. So it it's just it doesn't make any sense to be doing it that way. In my opinion, the long-term operational cost would be probably closer to half that. Um, so when you add all that up together, in fact, you get a uh, total all baked in cost to mine a Bitcoin at around $20,000, not the 42,000 or 43,000 that they're suggesting in this report. Um, so again, this is how I come uh, about to, to the math based on what I've seen here. Uh, you can evaluate this for yourself uh, based on however you want to uh, evaluate it. But I don't agree with the way that they've chosen to do it. And so far, all they've been able to do is point at bad actors that that may be around them, but not at them directly. If you look at them directly, you realize that this is a very, very large company that mines currently uh, nearly a thousand Bitcoin every single month. That is proof in the pudding, as far as I'm concerned. They're making the claim that they've over they've overhyped their while comparing them and claiming that they are at a discount to their peers like uh, Riot and Mara. And they point to the fact that in their presentation, uh, they don't have any. They didn't assign any value to Riot's hosting uh, hash rate. Their that hosting business. They say here that Riot has a 750 megawatt hosting business. Why is this excluded? Uh, this is not true. Riot does not have a 750 megawatt hosting business. The hosting business is closer to 200 megawatts. The rest of it is their own self mining operations, which are still currently being built out. Um, they didn't exclude it. They said not available because Riot does not and has not uh, published uh, what their revenues are from their hosting business. So it's not available. In the case of Marathon, they put zero. In the case of Riot, they put not available. I'd say that's pretty fair. They also show here that they largely underestimated what Marathon's adjusted uh, annualized revenue would be, uh, saying that the current consensus is uh, higher than that. But okay, that's great. Um, even if it is as high as they're suggesting, their annualized one is twice still what the, the current consensus is on Marathon. So yeah, it's the, it, it, their argument still holds. Whether you're looking at 481 or 551, Core Scientific at over uh, a billion is definitely more. So I don't understand what the problem here is. Uh, with the, making the claim that it is undervalued with respect to its peers. It obviously is. And of course, they get into, uh, again, they have more and more about the new miner uh, fiasco, which we all know full well what's going on here. But uh, this is something, again, that has nothing to do with Core Scientific. So they're just pointing at this to suggest that, hey, look, there's some shady stuff maybe going on um, and they're in close proximity to it. Again, doesn't really hold a lot of water with me. I'm only interested in what they're actually doing. Their facilities are real. Uh, this is, we've seen them. Well, at least if you've seen or followed any of uh, Vosk over at the Voscoin YouTube channel, toured their facilities in... 2020, I believe it was, uh, and they've been in business uh, providing hosting services for many years. Uh, these people know what they're doing. Just yesterday, they announced that in February, they mined 981 Bitcoin, despite the increase in the Bitcoin hash rate. 
and increased their mi self mining hash rate to 8.2 exahash per second. They are moving very, very fast and also increased their hosted hash rate to 7.7. .7. Honestly, I don't know how they're doing this so quickly. Um, it's quite impressive. And I'd love to learn, I'm looking more and more into this company because as I've made it clear, I haven't, I've, I have some money sitting on the sidelines and I definitely have my eyes on this company. But I think that this, you know, in light of the current uh, market situation, um, I still think it's a good idea to wait and see how things develop over the next few months. But during that time, they're gonna continue to expand and grow. They have an enormous and a very impressive pipeline of miners that are coming online throughout 2022. So uh, they are definitely going to be uh, moving very, very quickly. And uh, they're, I don't know, I'm going to have to be watching this one very, very closely. And the next capitulation we have, if we do have one, I'm going to have to look at uh, expanding into this position. One thing I found interesting while I was doing my research is that they're, they set up a deal to set up, develop another 500 megawatt data center in the port of Muskogee uh, in this industrial park in Oklahoma. And this wasn't even made public in any press releases, but it did show up in one of their SEC filings from uh, February 7th. Uh, so I again, this is quite remarkable 500 megawatts is no joke um so clearly they have a plan and a path forward uh, i f fail to understand why someone would really want to pick a fight with this company and bet against it uh, i don't see the pattern of failure here so that's my take on all of this um I know that was fairly long-winded <laughs> and but there's a lot of data to get through there and uh I think I covered everything that I wanted to really get through. Um, for me, I've got a pretty high level of conviction that this company is going to do extremely well when uh, the markets finally decide to turn and we start to resume our, you know, our regularly scheduled programming uh, as we hopefully eventually within the next uh, year or two find ourselves approaching all time highs yet again. Uh, I have faith that th those days will return and um, being in a company like this is something that I would definitely be looking for. But who knows, maybe these short sellers will get lucky uh, and despite their performance and continued successes, there could be downward pressure on these stocks and maybe they get out and make a tidy profit. Um, but <laughs> if any, if today's performance in, there, in that uh, stock is any indication, um, uh, it's not looking great as far as I'm concerned. That's all for this one. Now let's get back to empire building.